Seth, welcome to How the Light Gets In Festival. Uh, it's great to be here, it really is, thank you. Um, so consciousness is obviously a very big topic for you. What first got you interested in it? I think everyone's interested in consciousness, right? I mean, I remember being a kid and at some point just asking myself these questions. Who am I? What happened? Where was I before I was born? What happens after I die? Rapidly lead to questions about why am I having experiences? Maybe this is a bit further than, than some people go. But it's a, it's a big question and it's the kind of thing you talk about in the pub with your friends and it's, it's always been a strong interest to me. How do we define consciousness and when we talk about it in this context? What is consciousness? It's a, very, it's a very good question. It's actually very hard to come up with a consensus definition that everybody's going to agree on. But I don't think that's necessary at this stage. In, in science, definitions often evolve along with a greater understanding of a phenomenon. So, so long as we define it in a way that roughly we know what we're talking about, that's fine. And I like philosopher Thomas Nagel's definition that for a conscious organism, there is something it is like to be that organism. Put it another way, consciousness is any kind of subjective experience whatsoever. It's not the same thing as intelligence, it's not the same thing as having language, it's not the same thing as behaving in complicated ways, it's the presence of any kind of experience whatsoever. You say somewhere that people often confuse consciousness for intelligence and therefore leading to kind of misconceptions around whether AI is conscious or whether it can become conscious. Why do you think we confuse the two? Is it because just the, they correlate very strongly? What's the, what's the right. reason behind it? I don't think, so I think the confusion can be overstated. I think most people do recognize there's, there's a difference. We, we can talk about consciousness in other animals that we might not ascribe human level intelligence to. And of course we think babies are, are babies are actually very intelligent manipulating people. But, but I think we do recognize there's a difference at some level. But at another level, I think we're tempted to overstate their dependency. So there are some theories of consciousness that, that associate it with being able, having a brain that can reflect on its own activity in, in various ways. And of course, there is this idea that as artificial intelligence continues to accelerate and maybe crosses some threshold, that the lights come on and awareness happens. I don't think there's a good reason to why that should be the case. But why do people think that? And I think this, is, this really traces to sort of anthropocentrism, this, this, this tend tendency humans have to put themselves at the center of everything and the top of every pyramid. We think we're intelligent and we know we're conscious. So we tend to associate the two together. You mentioned there something about you know, the, the way we think about it is like the lights coming in and the kind of certain awareness coming uh, becoming apparent and that sort of seems to be referencing a kind of concept of self-consciousness as it were. How do the two concepts relate consciousness and self-consciousness? Do they go together or are they separate? Consciousness and self are at a very deep level, for me anyway, very very intimately related but at a, a different level not related at all and I want to make that distinction I think it's important. Being a self is not one single thing. We have many aspects that, that together constitute our experience of being who we are. There's this very high level aspect of self that I am a person with a set of memories uh, and a personal identity and a name and a set of social relations. It, that's a very species specific, quite high level aspect of selfhood. I don't think that is remotely coextensive with consciousness. You don't have to have that kind of self-consciousness to be conscious. But there are much more basic forms of self. The experience of just being a body, of being alive, of emotion and mood. And the argument that I make in, in, in the book and that I've been thinking about for a few years now is that aspect of self, that might be really fundamental to all human consciousness. You've written a, a, an article for us at the II, which is on the self and in which you argue that even though we usually think of the self as this kind of locus of perception, the point through which we perceive the world, in fact, it is just another kind of perception. The self is a perception. How do we make sense of this, uh, of, of a perception without a perceiver, as it were? It's difficult to, to make sense of it in everyday life. So the, the idea here is that, indeed, the self is not the thing that does the perceiving. The self 
itself is a, a bunch of perceptions. It's an old idea. It goes back to Hume. It's very present in a lot of Eastern spiritual traditions as well. Uh, it seems like, at least to most of us most of the time, that the self is this, the recipient of information from the world, and it's the thing doing the perceiving. It's very hard to actually cash that out in terms of how things work in the brain. It leads you into this infinite regress. You're, you're postulating some inner homunculus. Um, things don't really work that way at all. It's much more, I think, useful to think of the self as, as a perception that's constructed in a similar way to our perceptions of, of the outside world. Part of the experience of self is emotion and mood. And we can think of those as particular kinds of perceptions of the body that are, are underpinned by mechanisms that are very similar to those that underpin our experience of things out there in the world. It's a challenge though in everyday life to really take that on board. And, and you know, I'm, a very, uh, I'm not a very good meditator, but I do meditate. And, and one of the things that in meditation um, happens, one of the things that can happen anyway, is this recognition in the unfolding of experience that if you really look for the self, there's nothing to be found. So going back to the Nagel definition of consciousness then, like what is it that's there, that it is something to be like that thing that's there, right? If, if the self is just the perception, what is, what is, the, what is the thing that, it, you know, what is the underlying thing? Is there no underlying thing? Is there any underlying thing? Well, it depends, of course, like all these things, that there's always this tendency we have we, 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 to think of ourselves, there must be some essence of me or of you that is in some sense different from the stuff we're made of that might survive over time unchanged, that might you know, perhaps even survive the death of the body. I just don't think that's a, a useful idea. It doesn't undermine the value of being a self at all. And the experience of being a self does change over time. It feels continuous. It's continuous in some ways, but in other ways, what it's like to be me right now is, is quite different from what it was like to be me a few years ago, or certainly 30 years ago. Yet, it's tempting to think there is a still a stable, you know, there's an essence of me that's just continuous across all that time. You know, maybe there are a few cells that are still there or whatever, but that's, I don't think that's particularly relevant. No, I think there isn't any essence of, of me or you. There are just perceptions which unfold over time. So one of your lines is that consciousness is a kind of hallucination of the brain. And I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. Right. So I talk about conscious experience and especially conscious perception as a controlled hallucination. And the control is very important here, equally as important as the word hallucination. Because it can be often misunderstood as saying that like nothing is real, everything we experience is made up, that's absolutely not uh, what the claim is. There is an objective reality, at least I think there is, you can go ask a physicist, but the way this reality appears to us in our experience is always a construction. It's not that the world pours itself into our minds through the transparent windows of our senses. It's always an active construction. Um, and so this is why there's a continuity between perception as it normally unfolds and something like hallucination. We understand hallucination to be an internally generated perception, and, and it is. But so is normal perception. The difference is that hallucination, as we typically understand it, is an internally generated perception that's lost its grip on, on the real world, whereas normal perception is an internally generated construction that is very, very tightly geared to what's out there in the world. But there's a lot more to say there. I mean, just to say, so one of the things that we're doing in, in my lab at the moment is there are many different kinds of hallucinations. People just you know, use the word, but like many things in language, we're glossing over a richly informative diversity of different kinds of experience. So one of the things that uh, we're doing is now trying to build computational models of different kinds of hallucinations. For instance, psychedelic hallucinations involve things like ego, dissolution, this, this back to our discussion about the self, that seems to dissolve a bit. But perception is altered in a way that it seems to be a manipulation of what's out there in the world quite often. Whereas 
uh, the sorts of hallucinations that might arise in Parkinson's disease or, or dementia have a very different character. And if we can understand really what's underpinning these different kinds of actual hallucination, that sheds light back on how normal perception is working in the here and now for all of us. So your, your big project is trying to demystify consciousness, explain consciousness through science. For a long time, it's been a topic that you know, belong to philosophers and philosophers discuss, you know, the hard problem of consciousness and the easy problem of consciousness. And you, you talk about how, you know, there's this other problem that, you know, science needs to figure out, you know, the real, the real problem, as it were, of consciousness. Do you think science will one day totally sort of explain away all the mysteries around consciousness? Or will there always be this kind of philosophical component to the phenomenon that, you know, science won't be able to account for? Well, there will always be a philosophical component. I mean, it's, it's fundamentally a, a, as, as, as deeply philosophical as it is scientific. For me, the question is, you know, will science ultimately dissolve the sense of mystery that surrounds consciousness? Will, we still, will it still seem to be this beyond the reach and remit of science, this, this situation where we have, on the one hand, conscious experiences, and on the other hand, mere mechanism? Uh, my bet is that by trying to, as I call it, the, sort of the real problem, by trying to identify and account for different properties of consciousness in terms of mechanisms, that sense of mystery will, will dissolve. Whether it will dissolve entirely, I have to be honest, I don't, I don't know. But what else can we do? I think science is the best way, you know, coupled with philosophy, not independently. I really don't think they should be you know, put in opposition, and they aren't. And one of the joys of my career so far is this... this productive interaction of scientifically literate philosophers and philosophically literate scientists working uh, together. Let's see. Maybe the, the question will dissolve entirely just as the hard problem of life dissolved. We no longer worry about looking for a, an elan vital, a spark of life. But maybe it won't, and that's for the future to say. Do you think science will have to radically change, as it were, to incorporate the phenomenon of consciousness fully, to take into account this kind of perspectival aspect of it? Or do you think science can remain as it is now, this kind of third person objective view on the world, quantitative, mathematical, not taking into account sort of subjectivity? I'm, yeah, this is a very good question. It's a specific challenge for consciousness, that it is different. You can't put a conscious experience on the table and look at it in the same way that you can for other things uh, in, in science. Now this has led some philosophers and some neuroscientists and scientists to think that, well, you know, that means that we can't do a science of consciousness or that we can't do an exhaustive science of consciousness. It's true, the data are harder to get, but we can get data and we can get descriptions of people's first person experience. It's challenging, but we can. We can even infer something about it in non-human animals and in infants as well. So I don't think we need to massively change you know, the structure and nature of science. It's not even clear to me how we would. But I do think there, there is a specific challenge here. And this is one of the reasons why I have to have a bit of humility about whether there will be any residual sense of mystery. But I think the larger reason why there might be is simply that we ourselves are conscious. We're trying to explain us. And so we tend to apply a slightly different standard to what we expect from scientific explanation than we do for other things that are not us. We seem to want it to make intuitive sense or to even actually create this <laughs> consciousness somehow. And that's just not going to happen. That's not what scientific explanations do. This uh, mind-body problem goes all the way back to Descartes. If you could have a one-to-one -one with, uh, with him, what would you tell him? to convince him that the mind isn't separate from the body. Oh, I wouldn't want to, I would want to hear what he has to say. I wouldn't be telling him anything. I mean, I think Descartes comes in for a lot of stick these days, you know, for, for separating the mind and the body. Of course, he wasn't the first person to do that. And more related to my own uh, work, he also said that other animals were mere beast machines, that they were flesh and blood kind of automata that didn't have the rational conscious minds that, that imbued ethical and moral status. But of course, he was working in a really complicated time where to profess certain beliefs about self and consciousness could rapidly lead to, to bad things happening uh, from the church. So I just want to know from Descartes what he really thought. Neil, Seth, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah.
For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.